I'm delighted to be able to um, introduce our speaker this evening. I formally um, or informally met him at the uh, Irvine Singles Conference back uh, in August. And normally the Irvine Singles Conference has a reputation of outstanding speakers. And Dan was certainly one of the, the ones there um, back in August. In fact, I had a non-member friend that was attending that singles conference that I had just met a couple of months previous. And she was there, and uh, she attended Dan's class. And I'm happy to report now that she's a member of our church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, it's people like Dan that have influenced many uh, to, I'm sure, ponder and pray and join the church. So it's uh, my delight to be able to introduce him tonight. He grew up in Granada Hills, California, suburb of Los Angeles. And at age 17, he met a young lady at a steak singles dance who later became uh, his wife. And that was in 1972. He attended UCLA in 1973, spent one year there, and then went on a two-year mission to Venezuela. Came back to UCLA and graduated there. Also, his mission was 1974 to 1976. He came back a year later, married that young lady that he met, and um, they are happy parents of four girls and two boys and 12 grandchildren. After completing his undergraduate at UCLA in 17 or 1979, he went off to uh, BYU to the J. Reuben Clark Law School and uh, graduated there in 1982. He has served as ward mission leader Elders Quorum President, High Counselor, uh, member of the stake presidency in the Santa Margarita stake. He currently teaches the gospel doctrine class in his ward, and I'm sure you probably do not find anybody standing in the halls during his Sunday school class, and you'll uh, understand that in a few minutes. He is also a member of the stake Sunday school presidency in his stake. And he teaches um, Book of Mormon class every Thursday night uh, to the singles there in the stake, there in Orange County in Mission Viejo. And a few um, of the San Diego North County people I have seen there at that class. And I don't make it every Thursday night either, but um, he is worth the drive. And there must be 80 or 90 people that attend that class every Thursday. So we're delighted to, to have him to address us this evening. Thank you, Tom. I uh, want to disclaim something. And the thing I'd like to disclaim is that I'm just like the rest of you. Uh, I'm a member of the church. I have been a member of the church my whole life. Um, I have a, an abiding testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't consider myself an expert in hardly anything. Uh, my profession is I'm a civil business litigator. Um, that means courtroom work and various things for business. Um, that is how I get through the day. That is not my passion. My passion is the Book of Mormon. And for that reason, um, I was asked to teach a Book of Mormon class to the singles in the several stakes where I am. That's uh, Santa Margarita, Mission Viejo, uh, Laguna Niguel. Um, covers San Clemente to Irvine, Newport Beach. Um, and we have a delightful time uh, every Thursday night trying to, um, and we're just about finished actually. We've, we've been with the Book of Mormon now for over a year and we'll begin church history uh, and uh, Doctrine and Covenants beginning in January. So with that slight disclaimer, I don't profess um, expertise in the Book of Mormon, but I do profess a love of it and a lifetime study of it. Um, I happened to be at the right place at the right time um, when I was in law school at BYU in 1982. That was about the time when the interest in the Book of Mormon was being elevated. It was, I think, 84 when President Benson reminded us that we are still under condemnation. 
as the early saints were, for not having paid attention, as we should, to the jewel that is the Book of Mormon. Um, so when I was there, um, I took a class. Law school had a class, that the only law school in the country that would have had such a class. It was a one-unit class. It was entitled Ancient Legal Systems and the Scriptures. It's taught by Jack Welch. If you know who Jack Welch is, he was the founder of Farms. Farms is the foundation for ancient research and Mormon studies. Um, he is brilliant. He continues to teach uh, at BYU. Uh, we'll end a little bit, hopefully, if I have time, with something that he discovered in the Book of Mormon that, that's quite unique and significant. Um, I also am a lover of Hugh Nibley. I have read all his books except for his last one, which is almost impossible to read. Um, his last one is called One Eternal Round, and um, it's a hard one. Uh, I've got to get a lot of time devoted to that because it's going to take a lot of time and attention. Uh, he is, in my opinion, the greatest mind the church has ever produced. Uh, spoke 16 languages, um, was a lover of antiquity. But more than that, he was a lover of the Book of Mormon and the Restoration, Joseph and Brigham. So let me begin with this. 1830, the way the Book of Mormon was introduced to the world, with the following headline in that 1830 Rochester Daily Advertiser. Blasphemy, in quotes and all caps. The Book of Mormon has been placed in our hands. A vile or imposition was never practiced. It is an evidence of fraud, blasphemy, and credulity shocking to both Christians and moralists. Those words were picked up by newspapers in Vermont and in Boston. That's quite a way to be introduced. All caps, blasphemy. Welcome to the world, Book of Mormon. Um, what's so blasphemic about the Book of Mormon? If you read the Book of Mormon for its content, and if you were not a member of this church, you would not be offended. The Book of Mormon is Christ-centered. In fact, you'd probably use the Book of Mormon against Mormons in some of our beliefs. You'd probably make an argument that the Book of Mormon is grace-centered, not work-centered. You'd probably make the argument that you might even make an argument for the Trinity. You'd be wrong, but you'd try to make that argument. That's not the problem. The content of the Book of Mormon is not what generated this headline. What generated this headline is what the Book of Mormon signaled. And what it signaled was the heavens are open. Revelation exists. God speaks to man today. Prophets are on the earth. That was the blasphemy. So you see, it's not what the Book of Mormon says. It's the fact that we have it, that we claim it. That's the problem. Well, given that, given the antipathy to the Book of Mormon, one has to wonder what we do with such a book. We claim in our testimony meetings to know the church is true. And if I were to cross-examine someone who actually said that and actually drill down to how you know that, it could be really interesting. I submit to you that you don't know the church is true because you've read the New Testament, the Old Testament, or the Doctrine and Covenants, or the Pearl of Great Prize. None of those books get you to the grove. Our job is to get to the grove. And by that I mean we have to know that what happened in that morning in the spring of 1820 actually happened. Because if you don't have a testimony of Joseph and the Restoration, then it doesn't much matter. If you come to church, you will come to church on a superficial level, hopefully trying to get a deeper testimony. What has to happen is we have to replicate what happened there. And we can't do it. We don't have a video of it, so we have to replicate it in our own lives. And the way we do that is through the Book of Mormon. It is the key to all of this. Moroni gave us the promise. In fact, in 3 Nephi, it tells us in essence, not in essence, I think it's clearer than in essence, you don't gain a testimony of the Book of Mormon, salvation is at stake. This is the vehicle that the Lord has ordained. It's the Book of Mormon. So what do we do with it? We read it, we talk about it, but we do we answer the following question. 
which is how it's attacked. Is it of man or is it of God? That's the question. We have it. Here's my version, the duct tape version. Here it is. You can buy this at Deseret Book. Just ask for duct tape and they'll give it to you. Okay. This is the big version. Big version when your eyesight is failing and you can't miss it. And it also allows you to write in the margins. So this is what I have used for to teach seminary and to teach the adults. And it has held me. I, I don't want to lose it because it's got too many notes in it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it going until, until the ink rubs off the pages. This is a treasure. It is, as Nibley said, a tour de force. But would you know that if all you did was sit in gospel doctrine or at home and read its words? Would you know how significant this is? Would you know anything about the first 40 pages? If I said to you, what is significant about the first 40 pages? I don't know. Why 40? Because... It's at page 40, or roughly page 40, when they get on the boat in Bountiful and they head to the New World. That is a significant break. You've got Old World stuff and you've got New World stuff. You want to learn about Old World stuff? It's Nibley, and I, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to go through him. Really. If you want to world about New World stuff, it's John Sorensen. Read his latest book. It's a tough book. It's 750 pages. It's called Mormon's Codex. You can get it at Deseret Book for 50 bucks. It is his his opus, it's the New World and the Book of Mormon. It's Mesoamerica and the Book of Mormon. I finished it a couple weeks ago. It's fabulous. Well, when I took this course on the ancient legal systems and the scriptures in, 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 in uh, law school, for Jack Welch, who was my professor, my assignment was, you're a defense attorney for Nephi killing Laban. Go defend him. I had to write a paper on how I would defend him under Israelite law in 600 B.C. Jerusalem. Um, that was a whole... That, that I spent more time in the Harold B. Lee Law Library for one lousy unit than I did, I think, in any other law school class. Uh, but I learned a lot, and I learned more than that to gain an appreciation for the detail. We say in the law, which is rightly so, read the fine print. The devil is in the details. I can't tell you how many contracts I've litigated where the contract was lousy. The lawyers who wrote it didn't know what they were doing, or if they did, they intentionally stuck in ambiguity because it's a mess. The devil is usually in the detail when we're talking about worldly things. When it comes to this, God is in the details. Look very closely at what the Book of Mormon says, and you will find treasures now, don't confuse the fact that you gain a testimony through what Moroni said. I am not suggesting otherwise. I know how you gain a testimony of this work. But I also know that we are here to defend what we believe. You can't defend it if you don't understand it or you don't fully know it. How can you defend it? So... Brother Tom here asked me a question prior to tonight, and I'll give you an example. If I can find my notes on this, because I have lots of notes. Um, the example was Alma 7. Alma 7 has been criticized. When I was uh, back uh, in Nauvoo, um, right before the dedication, um, I saw in the window in a Nauvoo shop a bumper sticker that said, Bethlehem or Jerusalem, question mark. You think, well, that's an odd bumper sticker. Well, it happens to be an anti-Mormon bumper sticker. And it goes to Alma 7. This is a simple answer. But someone could throw this at you and you wouldn't understand what to do with it. But it's not difficult. I get upset when, when members of the church seem to go off the rails because they saw something on the internet or someone told them something and all of a sudden they're spinning out of control. No one ever told me this in gospel doctrine. Nobody ever told this, me this in seminary. Okay, there's a lot you haven't been told in seminary or gospel doctrine. So go around and start looking. It's not hard to find. It's called Deseret Book Online. There's all kinds of stuff. This stuff is available, has been for decades. 
We're not hiding anything. We just have to dig for it. So what's the problem with Alma 7? And Alma 7 is, it seems pretty innocuous until you find bumper stickers like that in Nauvoo. And I think, really? You're really going to put this on a bumper sticker? All right. Christ shall be born of Mary. Right? This is 83 B.C. Christ has not yet been born. It's a prophecy. And behold, he shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel. Aha! Christ was not born in Jerusalem. He was born in Bethlehem. Five-year-old knows that. Right? That's an easy one. I have two responses to that. First one is, notice it says, at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers. That's the first response. When we speak of Jerusalem, it's important to notice Nephi's preference for a non-biblical expression, the land of Jerusalem. While he and his brothers, while he and his brothers always regard the land of Jerusalem as their home, it is perfectly clear from a number of passages that the land of our father's inheritance cannot possibly be within or even near the city. And he goes on to discuss that. In the Amarna letters, we read of the land of Jerusalem in an area larger than the city itself. Also, the reference to the land of Jerusalem appears in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There is the city of Jerusalem and there's a land of Jerusalem, the land surrounding it. Same thing when they got to the New World many, many times. The references in the Book of Mormon is to the land not just the city, including Zarahemla and other well-known cities. But here's the other, more fun one. If you have any sense at all about the Book of Mormon and about its complexity, you would at least have to say that Joseph Smith, or whoever wrote the Book of Mormon, was really bright. They have come to that now. He's a genius. When you say someone's a genius, that simply means you have no explanation. Harold Bloom, professor at Yale, that's what he calls Joseph Smith, a genius. Richard Bushman, the the writer of Rust Stone Rolling, responded to that and said, when that happens, when someone declares you a genius, that means they have no idea, they have no way of explaining what you've done. Given that, given the complexity of the Book of Mormon, do you think that a fraud, a charlatan, is going to make this mistake? They'll make a lot of mistakes, but they won't make this one. Since a five-year-old knows he was born in Bethlehem, which is six miles outside of the city. It's a suburb, six miles. He's never going to make this mistake. Not someone as sophisticated to pull off this kind of a fraud would never make that mistake. You're going to make other ones, but you wouldn't make this one. You see? It is nonsensical. First of all, it's wrong because we now have tons of information on how Jerusalem is referred to as the land of Jerusalem, which we did not have at the time of Joseph. He's right. It's a bullseye. But even even beyond that, this is not a mistake he would make. When you choose to write, if you were a charlatan, the last thing you would do is write history. Nephi places us in 600 B.C., first year of the reign of Zedekiah. We know Zedekiah was a puppet king of Nebuchadnezzar. We know he was 21 years old. We know a lot about Zedekiah from the Bible. And we know a lot about that time time in history. 600 B.C., 600 B.C., there was a lot going on. And we know a lot about what was going on in 600 B.C. So the last thing he's going to do is, at that time, put us in a time and a place, and then what? Well, he's got to get it right because he now has a time and a place. He's not just giving us philosophical ideas or he's not just giving us um, even visions or doctrine. He's giving us history. Very testable. That's the problem. Okay, so given all of that, you have to come back to it and say, if Joseph Smith did not get this book the way he said he got it, how in the world do we have it? How in the world do we have it, is the question. Well, a couple of things. Um, You remember 
when they had to go back to get the plates. And the boys were outside the walls of Jerusalem, and they did paper, rock, scissors. Now, I know that the Book of Mormon doesn't say paper, rock, scissors. It says they cast lots. Same thing. And Laban lost. And he had to go in to get the plates. And he tried to get the plates from Laban. Laban um, would have none of it and accused him of being a robber and chased him and tried to kill him. Then, he, then they tried to buy them. Remember? That didn't work either. He accused them of being robbers, and he chased after them. Uh, why didn't he call them thieves? He called them robbers. In our law, there is very little difference between a robber and a thief. In their law, there was a massive difference between robbers and thieves. Robbers were organized crime. The word bandit comes from band, which is a group. It's a conspiracy. These people were highwaymen. They were dangerous to society. A thief was dealt with civilly by the, by the elders of the city. Robbers were dealt with summarily, and the penalty was death. In ancient Israel, there was a distinction between thieves and robbers. You have Gadianton robbers. You do not have Gadianton thieves. Laban is calling them robbers, justifying his use of force. You see? If he had said, you are a thief, and I'm going to send my men to kill you, couldn't do that. Because theft, theft did not have a, was not a capital crime. But if you're a robber, ah, very different. That is not the law Joseph would have known in upstate New York in 1830. For that kind of law, you've got to go way back. But the difference between robbers and thieves is significant. Joseph does not make the mistake. He gets it right. And the fact that Gadiant and robbers bring down a civilization, in fact, they bring down two civilizations. Organized crime brings down the Jaredites and it brings down the Nephites. And Mormon and Moroni tell us as much. So there's one. When the band gets three days outside of Jerusalem, Nephi tells us it's been three days' journey. And then what does he tell us? He tells us that my father built an altar. Do we care that it was three days outside of Jerusalem? Who cares? You've read that a million times. It's ne it never gets quoted in sacrament meeting. never gets quoted in talk. No one bothers. They just go right past it, on to the theological concept. Stop. Why does he tell us it's three days? Because the law requires you. If, you. if you are within three days' journey of a sanctuary, you are not entitled to build your own altar. Once you're three days out, you can build your own altar. There's a sanctuary in Jerusalem. You are not permitted to build an altar unless you are three days or more away from the sanctuary at Jerusalem. So Nephi tells us, we're living the law of Moses. We're not going to get this wrong. We're three days out. We're building our altar. You see? Now, you would skip right over that. What about Laban? The boys are worried about Laban because he can command 50. Where do you get 50? Yeah, there are references in the Bible to 50 and 100 and, and 1,000. But for the garrison of a city, 50? It was the size of a Babylonian platoon, 50. And he commands 10,000 in the field. But Laman and Lemuel weren't, weren't concerned about the 10,000 that Laban could command in the field. This is First Nephi 4 and 5. He was concerned about what was going on inside the city. They're 50. He was worried about the 50. He can kill us. He's got 50. A50 is what it was referred to by the Babylonians. You see? You're just going to pick that number out of the air and say, yeah, he, he commanded a group of 50. Well, Babylon was that, what, remember, it was Nebuchadnezzar. It was, it was Nebuchadnezzar who, was, who put Zedekiah on the throne. You would get a lot of Babylonian stuff going on in Jerusalem because they were the overlord, and Egypt was down here, and Egypt was the rival. And this is why ultimately they came in in 586 and wiped them out, prophesied by Jeremiah who lived through it. Um, because they had turned to Babylon and not to Egypt. Excuse me, the other way around. They turned to Egypt instead of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar would have none of it and came in and wiped them out. The first time he came in, that's when he took him, Ezekiel and others back to Babylon. Second time, he wiped them out. Remember, he took Zedekiah, who had sons. He killed the sons, and then they took out his eyes. The last thing you would see in this life would be the death of your sons. But they missed one son. Zedekiah had a son by the name of Mulek. Mulek got away. Mulek made it to the New World. Mulek founded Zarahemla. Remember, we have the Jaredites, the Mulekites, and the Nephites. You see, this is historical. And if you're going to write history and you're a fraud, you're going to trip up. And you're going to make mistakes. Unless you get this book the way Joseph got it, which was of God. 
Okay. Oaths. Remember Zoram? He grabs Zoram around the neck. Zoram's trying to run. Once he finds out who it is, the jig is up. And he whispers an oath in his ear. He says, surely, as the Lord liveth and as I live, we will not harm you. You will have place with us. Zoram immediately relaxes. Oaths were serious. They were very serious. They would not be broken. They wouldn't dream of breaking them. Zoram heard that oath. You have to swear by the life of something. He gave the most powerful oath a Semitic person could ever give. I swear by my life and by the life of God. I could swear by the blade of grass, but that's not a very powerful oath. But if I swear by my life and by God's life, that is an oath no one would ever break. That's exactly what Nephi does when he grabs Zoram around the neck. And Zoram immediately relaxes. You see? Well, the slaying of Laban, I won't spend much time on because there's a lot of other cool stuff to talk about. And all I can do is just give you an overview because time doesn't permit more than that. But uh, I tried to figure out what the defense would be for Laban or for Nephi. I didn't have very many. Uh, What are the possibilities? Burglary? No. No. The only way you can kill someone is if they're in the act of breaking into your house. It's still the law, by the way. It's, it's, US, it's common law. It's English common law. Theft. Theft was not a capital crime. Attempted murder. There was no such crime under Israelite law. You either did it or you didn't. But there was no law that says you, if you attempt it, I'm going to throw you in jail because you tried, even though you failed. Right? Self-defense. There was no immediate threat to Nephi. None. Laban is... Drunk in the street, he's unconscious. What's the, where's the self-defense to Nephi? So I struck out there. How about, he's a minor, he didn't know what he was doing. Well, he'd have to be under 13. He says he was young, large in stature. He probably was not under 13. Probably not. Duress. He was, he was forced to do it. By who? God. Maybe you can try that one in a courtroom. What's my best defense? No witnesses. I need two. And you can't self-incriminate. I need two witnesses. There's no DNA. There's none of the forensics that we have today. I need two witnesses. There aren't any witnesses. He walks. That was my defense. That's what I came down to. I had nothing else. But what's interesting about this is he uses the sword. That's what he had. Under Israelite law, there were four ways that you, you, capital punishment. Strangulation, hanging, strangulation, hanging, stoning, and decapitation with the sword. 35 capital crimes. 35. Decapitation with the sword was reserved for two crimes. One was murder, and the other one was an apostasy, the apostasy of a city. Think about this one for just a second. When I wrote my paper, ultimately, on this, I thought that, I don't know if anybody else thought it was interesting. I thought it was really interesting. How interesting is that? I'm using the right instrument because, is Laban guilty of murder? Probably. Who? Uriah. He's a prophet. Remember, there's several prophets who are, Uriah was, took off to Egypt. He was brought back and he was killed by the elders of Jerusalem. Laban was one of the elders of Jerusalem. So I probably got him on a murder charge. But more importantly than that, what is the ultimate reason the Spirit says to, to, to Nephi? He says, It is better that one man perish than an entire nation dwindle in unbelief. The apostasy of a city was if you take an entire group of people, a city, and because of your act, you lead them into apostasy at spiritual death. That's a capital crime worthy of death, and the execution method is decapitation with the sword. Seemed to fit for me. This is how I got into all of this. This is how I started looking at detail. Detail that you would have to be brilliant to be able to figure all this out. And in fact, as Nibley says, there was no one alive in 1830 that could have written the Book of Mormon. You hear that? It wasn't Solomon Spaulding. It wasn't Sidney Rigdon. By the way, if he'd written it, he would have shattered it from the rooftops, especially at the, at the transition from Joseph to Brigham when he gave his two-hour speech trying to convince people that he was the guardian of the church. And Brigham gets up, but he does, he, you know, he's, he's almost transfigured. All the diaries say, yeah, he looked like Joseph, he sounded like Joseph. So Brigham, Brigham is going to be the, the, he's the key holder, obviously. He holds the keys, president of the 12. 
Sidney said nothing, not a word. So if it wasn't Joseph, who was it? It's a great question. Where's the evidence of any of this? That's another great question. Okay. The broken bow. Nephi breaks his bow. His brothers, the bows, lose their spring. They're going down the borders of the Red Sea. The only way available to them is southwest. They can't go. The Mediterranean is over here. They can't go north. You got Babylon up there. You're not going up that way. You go due east. It's just nothing. You got to go south. And they did. They took their journey by the borders of the Red Sea. That's a southwest. And they get along that journey, and they have the breaking of the bow incident, which is very interesting. The breaking of the bow is uh, he breaks his steel bow, and his brothers break. They don't break them. They lose their spring. They now can't kill anything. They can't get food, and everybody's murmuring. Even Lehi is murmuring now. So what does Nephi do? He prays. He goes up to the mountain, and he fashions out of wood a wooden bow. Where's he going to get wood for that? You just don't make a bow out of ordinary wood. So it has to be the kind of wood that you could use in that part of the world, which is desolate. For a bow. We say, yeah, when I went to the mountain, I got, he's, you know, he's not in the alpine forest. He's, he's in the most desolate area on the planet, which is the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. Well, from study, we know there is what's called nab wood, which grew in the crags of Mount Jassim and Mount Azid, the borders near the Red Sea. Okay, so there's wood. Good, good guess, Joseph. You got lucky on that one. But then, then Nephi tells us something very interesting. He says, I had to make a new bow and an arrow. He didn't break his arrows. What's he doing making an arrow? Whoever wrote the account was familiar in some detail with the field of archery. Consider what happens to an arrow at the instant the spring is released. The full force of the drawn spring is applied to the end of the arrow trying to accelerate, but also tending to bend or buckle the arrow. If the bow's draw weight and the arrow's stiffness are not perfectly matched, the arrow will stray off the intended course or fall short of the mark. An arrow that is too flexible will leave the bow with a vibration that will cause the arrow to behave erratically. On the other hand, an arrow that is too stiff is probably too heavy for the bow. The arrow has to match the bow. Archery as a means of self-defense or as a serious method of hunting or warfare went out of vogue among Europeans many years before the time of Joseph Smith. On the other hand, archery as a sport did not emerge until the latter half of the 19th century. You see that detail? A little offhand remark by Nephi, I had to make an arrow. The trip east, they get to Nahum. Talk about a bullseye, Nahum. This is where Ishmael dies. He is mourned by his daughters. Remember, it's the females that do the mourning in that society, not the men. Hence, the daughters of Ishmael, doesn't say his sons, the daughters mourned their father's death. And when the mourning was over, and by the way, Nahum means place of mourning. Oh, I hate when Joseph keeps getting this stuff right. They bury their father. Then Joseph tells us in the beginning verse of the next chapter, and we did take our journey due east from that point. We can find Nahum on a map, believe it or not. It, wasn't, it, wasn't, it would not have been available to Joseph. There's no indication that the Manchester Library where he lived had any of these maps with Nahum on it. But I've seen all the maps and the dates. How in the world does he know there's a place by that name at that place that means what it says? And then if you go due east, where does this take you? That was the most difficult part of the journey. Nephi doesn't get into detail about what happened except to say it was really, really hard. They get to Bountiful. Bountiful has to have all kinds of things. It has to have cliffs. 
because they were going to throw their brother into the depths of the sea. What are you going to do? Take him to the, to the waves and toss him in? Of course not. It assumes you have cliffs. Cliffs that if you drop someone from, they will die because that's where they were going to haul him and drop him into the depths of the sea. You have to have honey. You have to have bees. You have to have big trees that will support the kind of wood that you need to make ships to cross the, the, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. It's a lot of water. There are probably 50 fresh water. You've got to have all kinds of ore. You've got to have ore to make metal, to, to make your tools. Where is there such a place on the Arabian Peninsula? Is there such a place? If you do a satellite map of the Arab Arabian Peninsula, you'll see a little patch of green in what is now modern-day Oman. So there's been an expedition to this place. It was done um, at least 10, 15 years ago, and there's a book on this, Lehi's Trail. And the church farms has done a video on this whole thing. And they brought geologists and botanists and everybody else, and they got them there, and they got permission from the government, and they went there, and they filmed the whole thing, and they said, this is the most likely spot for Bountiful. There are not a lot of choices. This is the most likely one. At the time, any text on, Arab, on, on Arabia would have shown you the opposite. Fervent, verdant, green in the middle, around the edges, desolate. It would have been wrong had he been able to consult such a book. The geography was wrong, but he didn't need to. Sherlock Holmes said to Dr. Watson, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. <clears throat> now, we could talk about olives. Don't have time to talk about olives. There's a whole book on olives. Jacob chapter 5 is the allegory of the olive tree. I would not have known how to do anything with olives. Olives don't grow in upstate New York. They're Mediterranean. They need rocky soil. They need, they need to be in California, or they need to be in Italy, or they need to be in Greece. That's where you're going to grow your olives, Mediterranean climate. The dunging, the patching, the, 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 the cutting the branches and splicing them in and actually having them grow and bear fruit, wild trees, tame trees, that whole discussion of olive horticulture is complex. Complex. It's an allegory. But it, it's based upon olive horticulture. All kinds of places you can trip up especially if you have no idea how to make olives or grow olives. Joseph would have known about maple syrup. They tapped trees for syrup as a way to live, the Smith family. Would have been done in the spring. He had no idea. He would not have known anything about how to make olives or how to, how to grow olives, how to do anything with olives. Oh, one of the other ones... Uh, uh, Book of Mormon, another howler in the Book of Mormon, the word Alma is Latin and it's feminine. In the Book of Mormon, it's masculine and you're claiming it's Hebrew. Everybody knows Alma Mater. Everybody knows that's Latin and everybody knows that's feminine because it ends with an A, right? Until you find a deed, real estate transfer deed, 600, 700 BC, Middle East. Alma, son of somebody. Son of Hebrew. We got masculine and we have Hebrew. That takes care of that one. They fall like flies. But for a while, people get all hot and bothered about this stuff because they think, oh, Alma, that's feminine. That's, that's, you know, that can't possibly. How did he get that name? I was at Education Week in August. Haven't been there in years. It's fabulous. I learned from one of the authors of the next book coming out, that they are preparing a book with every proper name in the Book of Mormon and its etymology. Every one of them, from Nephi to Sam to Laman to Lemuel to Gidgadoni to Zemnariha, all 350 names in the Book of Mormon, proper names, that Joseph Smith, according to the records, spelled out letter by letter. You're going to make this stuff up. Where do all these names come from? Are they Babylonian? Are they Egyptian? Are they Hebrew? What are they? What's their etymology? Or is it just a bunch of letters thrown together? 
When he puts I on the end of M-O-R-O-N, we know that I is a, is a suffix recognized Egypt all over the place. It's everywhere. So instead of moron, it's moron I. Moron is a place on Jaredites. You see that in the book of Ether. You put an I of moron. That's what moron I means, of that place. Well, we'll have it next year, they tell us. So I'll be watching for this one as another thing to look at, another evidence. Okay. In the limited time we have left, let me change um, a bit. Oh, two more things. I need to, actually three more. <laughs> In Alma 11, there's a whole discussion of weights and measures. Weights and measures. One of the earliest collections of law is called the Code of Esh, Eshnuna, which is Babylonian, 1800 B.C. It wasn't discovered until this last century, after, long after Joseph was dead. Do you remember that discussion in Alma, I think it's Alma 11, where it's, it's an equation. It's barley to silver and other grains. There's a, there's, a, there's a metallic element and there is a grain element. And barley is the big one. And you think, why would there be an exchange rate using metal or coinage on, or silver on the one hand and, and grain on the other hand? Who does that? Well, the Babylonians did. And there's a whole description, and I won't have time to get into it, whole description of how those equate. And there you have in Alma 11 the equation. It's all there. And, of course, they say, we, didn't, we don't reckon after the manner of the Jews. This is the Babylonians. And remember, Jeremiah was telling Zedekiah, you go make peace with the Babylonians, because if you don't, you'll be destroyed. And they refused. They didn't listen to him. They preferred the Egyptians. They thought the Egyptians would have their back. They didn't. Babylonians came in and wiped them out. And you can read all about that in Jeremiah, and it is, it is pathetic uh, how bad it was. Um, Zemnariha, third Nephi, Gadiant and robber. They catch him, they try him, and they kill him. How do they kill him? They hang him from a tree. Until he is dead. And then what do they do? You probably just keep reading. They cut down the tree. Tree didn't do anything. Innocent tree. Israelite law required. It's been defiled. You must cut it down. So what did they do? They would have pre-cut trees, like, for example, not necessarily a cross. That's a Roman concept. But a, a, a pillar of some sort. So they wouldn't have to cut down the tree. In this case, they had to fell the tree. The tree is buried along with the because people, he's, it, the tree's been defiled, so you must cut it down. That's the law. There it is in Third Nephi, and they felled the tree. How do you know this? How do you get this right? You don't. He had no idea. He's translating. He just said what he sees. But if he's a fraud, how does he get the detail that he could not possibly have known? Not only him, but nobody. How do you get it right? You must ask yourself that question because it is a burning, important, logical, consequential question. All right. Hebraisms. In the last few minutes that we have, let me talk to you about Hebraisms. I am no Hebraistic expert by any means. Stephen Ricks is. Uh, he's the guy I took the course from, um, and I read the books on this, and it's fascinating. But let me just give you Mark Twain when he read the Book of Mormon, claimed it to be, if you took out the words and it came to pass, it would be a pamphlet. Okay? He's a funny man. Right? And it put him to sleep. It's like chloroform in print, he said. It even has a book called Ether. Right? That's Mark Twain. Oh, but it's not great prose. Remember Mormon and Moroni, how concerned they were, the awkwardness of their hands in writing this? They said, you know, if we could written in Hebrew, there would be no mistakes, but we're writing in a Reformed script. We're writing in Reformed Egyptian. We're writing in a script, but we're, our language is Hebrew. If we could have written in Hebrew, he said, there would be no mistakes. But because of the space on the plates, we're using a shorthand. We don't know of any mistakes. But so often, our, our guides, our narr narrators, Mormon and Moroni, are so concerned that we would get to stumble, that... that that their words would not be powerful. They said, we're great speakers, 
but we're not good writers. And in, tw- in Ether 12, Moroni is just lamenting this. He says, what if they, 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 cri- they, meaning you, meaning us, what if they criticize us? What if all kinds of things happen and they don't listen to the message? And the Lord said, don't worry about it. You've done your job. Now it's on them. And that's when he said, I give unto men weaknesses. The great, the great discourse on faith and on weakness in Ether 12. That's the context. He was worried that we would not pay attention to his words, perhaps because they weren't poetic enough. Well, you don't have psalms in there. You don't have, you know, okay, great. And, and, and the language is awkward. Yeah, you know why it's awkward? Let me give you some examples. When English shows a possessive or descriptive relationship between two nouns, it usually puts the possessive or descriptive noun first. The king's house or a wood house. Or the White House. What does Spanish do? The Casa Blanca. Right? You put the noun first, and then you tell me what kind of house it is. That's actually more logical in Spanish than it is in English. If you send me white, I don't know what you're going to White horse or a white house? I don't know what the noun is. So that's why Spanish is actually more logical. It gives me the noun, then it gives me a description. It's la casa, the, the house, blanca, white. Right? What's Hebrew do? Hebrew uses the opposite order. If the Hebrew word order is kept in the English translation, the word of must be added. Plates of brass instead of brass plates. Works of righteousness instead of righteous works. Words of plainness. You've read these, you've read these over and over and over again, and you wonder why they're in there like that. It's not good English, but it's perfect Hebrew. Chains of hell, voice of the spirit, skin of blackness, rod of iron. Cognates, I have dreamed a dream. Work all manner of fine work instead of work well. And he did judge righteous judgments instead of judge righteously. We build buildings instead of simply build. And there there are tons of these. Cognate, cognitives. This is great. Listen to this. The Book of Mormon contains many examples of the Hebrew-like usage, which is you have to have connectors. In all manner of wood and of iron and of copper and of brass and of steel and of gold and of silver and of precious ores. Do you hear that? That's bad English. You put, you put that into your English teacher, she's going to get her red pen out and she's going to destroy it. She's going to say, who told you to put the word and everywhere? What we say is wood, iron, copper, brass, steel, gold, silver, and precious ores. We use and one time at the end, not Hebrew. It requires you to put and everywhere. And here it is, First Nephi. Hmm. I, if I had time, I would. Comparisons. We say he's richer than he is. He's brighter than he is. It's smaller than that. We use an ER on the end. Hebrew doesn't do that. It's a directional thing. So what does Hebrew do? A land which is choice above all other lands. Above. The tree which is precious above all, most abominable above all. The fruit which is sweet above all that is white, yea, and pure above all that is pure. It doesn't say sweeter or purer. There's no Hebrew reference for that. You have to have a reference above all that is white, above all that is pure. Naming conventions. We say, in English, when a child is born, we say, we called him Joe, or we called or named him Eric. The same is true in naming places. For example, he called his ranch Pleasant Valley. Hebrew expresses it quite differently. He called the name of his son Joe. You see? He called the name of his son Joe. Not his son, but his name. In Hebrew, it is the name that is called, not the child or the place. Perhaps the best known example from the Bible is the one found in Isaiah 7.14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You see that? Book of Mormon. And we did call the name of the place Shazer. 1 Nephi 16.13. And they called the name of the city Moroni. He had three sons and he called their names Mosiah and so forth. He called their names, not them, but their names. Great Hebrew, lousy English. 
possessive pronouns. In Hebrew, possessive pronoun is added to the end of the noun. Thus, my book would be the book of me. The Hebraic usage is reflected in several examples from the Book of Mormon. Hear the words of me. Bad English. You'd say, hear my words. Hear the words of me. Jacob 5, 2. The Gentiles shall be great in the eyes of me. Second Nephi. How unsearchable are the depths of the mysteries of him. And on it goes. Conditionals. In English, it's common to express a conditional idea in the following. If you come, then I will come. If, then, clauses. You're familiar with them, you use them all the time. Hebrew, the same idea is expressed in another way. If you come, and I will come. That makes no sense in English. We, we understand what you're saying, but it's bad English. When Joseph Smith translated First, seven, First Nephi 1750, he dictated, If he should command me that I should say unto this water, Be thou earth, and it shall be earth. That's how it was originally translated until Oliver changed it. The non-English construction was removed by Oliver as he copied the original manuscript to produce the printer's manuscript. He deleted the word and, making the text read better in English. The sentence now reads, If he should command me that I should say unto this water, Be thou earth, it should be earth. The and is gone. Okay. <clears throat> Let me do something on the board for just a minute, and then I'll come back and I'll conclude. Probably can't see this very well, but let me... Some of you have probably heard of this. But among the All right. Among the Hebraisms in the Book of Mormon. This one is my favorite. You're familiar with the concept of chiasm. C-H-I is the Greek word for X. Okay? C-H-I. Hence, this means X in Greek. Chiasm is this structure. It's an X. It's a Hebrew literary device. What it is, is a memory device. It's going to help you remember things, but it's repetitious. It's poetic. It's also in the Bible. It's also, do you remember the rock group ABBA? I know they do a backwards B. That's chiastic. Why is it chiastic? Because what you do is you say something, you say concept A, concept B, and you repeat concept B and concept A. You go into it this way, that's your X, and you back out of it in reverse order. Okay? The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. You see that? First, last, last, first. That's an easy one. And there are others like it. It's, a, it, it's, it's not just in biblical literature, it's in lots of places. Take a look at Mosiah 5, 10 to 12. When, if you have your scriptures, or even if you don't, just go home and check it out. Mosiah 5, 10 to 12. By the way, one of the professors at Education Week mentioned they had discovered 300 chiasms in the Book of Mormon. 300. And you've read this the whole time and had no clue what you were reading. You had no clue what you were reading was Hebrew poetry and a memory device to a culture that learned things orally, not in writing. They listen to things. That's why there's so much repetition. That's how we learn. Repetition is the mother of pedagogy. That's how you learn. You repeat, you repeat, you repeat. You have kids, you know what repetition is. You've got to tell them no 16 times. And then you hope one of the 16 sinks in. Okay, so I'm going to read this to you. 
just as it appears in the Book of Mormon. And you can see, I hope, if you can't, I will uh, explain it. Mosiah, chapter 5, 10 to 12. I will read it and I will point it out to you as we go through this. And now it shall come to pass that whosoever shall not take upon him the name of Christ. must be called by some other name. Therefore, he findeth himself on the left hand of God. Left hand. And we know that, right? This good, this good theology. Unless Christ is your God, you will be found on the left hand, which is not the place you want to be. You want to be on his right hand. That's the image. And I would that ye should remember also that this is the name that I said I would give unto you that never should be blotted out, except it be through transgression. Therefore, now we've come to the midpoint, transgression. Therefore, now we're backing out. Take heed that you do not transgress that the name be not blotted out. I say unto you, I would that ye should remember to retain the name written always in your hearts that ye are not found on that left hand of God, but ye hear and know the voice by which ye shall be called and the name by which he shall call you. 300 of these. I dare say, when you read the Book of Mormon, you didn't notice this. You may have thought, a little repetitious. But you probably would not have thought there's a structure to the repetition. He's just babbling. He's he's trying to fill space. The guy who discovered this in the Book of Mormon is Jack Welch. My professor. And friend. And... I went up and I checked to see what was new under the sun, and he gave a course at Education Week last August. Uh, yeah, Education Week in August, where he said, here's the story. He discovered it on his mission in Germany. He gave the story of chiasm, which I knew, and then just sort of talked about where this is leading. Now, I will say to you that the greatest chiasm, chiasms vary in complexity. They're not always as easy to spot as this one is. But even as easy as this is, you probably never saw it. I never did, until someone pointed it out to me. He discovered this in the 60s. 60s. So you're going to tell me that Joseph figured this out and wrote chiastically, leaving clues because he was such a good forger. I dare you, all with your college degrees and your, your graduate degrees, to write like this and make it cogent and make it flow. But the greatest chiasm is the entire chapter of Alma 36. It is a wonder. It is a masterpiece. It is one of my favorite chapters in all of Holy Writ, not just because of the way it's structured, but because of what it says. Remember, this is Alma talking to his son Helaman about his conversion 17 years prior. And he says, let me tell you about what happened to me and how I wish to become extinct, and it, 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 both in mind and body, rather than be in the presence of a holy being. Because I had effectively, he used the word murder, he said, well, I didn't murder anybody, but I led people away from the church, me and the sons of Mosiah. We were, we were hellions. We were doing horrible things. And when I understood what was at stake, when I understood what was at stake, I felt horrible. I wanted to be, I was harrowed up. Harrow is a farm instrument. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like spikes that rip up the dirt. My, my spirit, my soul was harrowed. It was ripped. It was torn. He's, he's, he's speaking of agony. And I was in this agony. And right in the middle of the chiasm, the, the point of the chiasm where the, the focus of, of the chiasm of, of Alma 36 is this beautiful part. It's just, it's, it's where he, he remembers a family home evening. Now, I realize he doesn't say family home evening. 
Here's what he says. Came to pass, I was thus racked with torment while I was harrowed up by the memory of my many sins. Behold, I remember also to have heard my father prophesy unto the people concerning the coming of one Jesus Christ, a son of God. I don't know if anybody cares about the, the article A instead of the article the. To me, I think it's significant. I'm the only one that I've ever heard thinks it's significant, but I think it's significant. He didn't say the Son of God. He said a Son of God. He did not know Christ. He knew his name. That's all he knew. Because he heard his father preach the name. It had no meaning for him. But he remembered the name. This is the key to the chiasm because this is the turning point. He, he holds on to that name and then cries out for Christ. This is all about the atonement. This chapter is about the change that happens in the atonement. About here, he says, I don't want to be in the presence of God. And after he goes through a cleansing process, what does he say? I say unto you, my son, there could be nothing so exquisite and so bitter as were my pains. And again, I say unto you, on the other hand, there could be nothing so exquisite and sweet as was my joy. He has now done a 180. Why? The atonement. Yea, methought I saw even as our father Lehi, he's quoting Lehi, God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God. Yea, and my soul did long to be there. As opposed to right over here where he says, I wanted to become extinct rather than be in the presence of a holy being. The difference? Cleansing of the atonement. That's the difference. This is in a chiastic form. Meaning it's intended for you to remember it. It's intended for you to get the point. And the point is, the centerpiece is Christ. You never knew this. I never knew this. I read this hundreds, how many times? I never got the structure. But you're going you're gonna to do this. You're going to do all of this all the way to Q and come out from Q, go all the way back to A. And you're going to repeat yourself in reverse order and you're not going to notice it. That's a talent. You've got to know to write that way. We don't write that way. That's Hebrew. It's somebody who's familiar with Hebrew who writes like this. Not us. Okay, my time is up. Let me just end with the following. Moroni tells us how we get a testimony. I don't want you to leave here tonight thinking, oh yeah, well, you know, that's not how you get a testimony. I don't care about robbers and thieves, and I don't care about bows and arrows. I'm not stupid. I know that. Don't leave here saying, well, you got it all wrong because he doesn't know how to testimony. Don't insult my intelligence. Really? The point is not how you gain a testimony. The point is you have to build it. You have to build your faith. You have to defend this work. We all do. Someone makes a challenge, respond to it. Well, I can't. I don't know the answer. Well, why don't you know the answer? Take a little effort. I wouldn't have known the answer either. I've been doing this for 30 years. This is my passion. This is important. This is your, this is your gospel. This is, this is the restoration. This is the grove. This is your testimony. It's right here. And the fact that you asked the question, well, Joseph Smith wrote the book. Don't insult. Stephen Ricks, I'll quote from him. Hebrew scholar, BYU professor, as of August. This is as near a quote as I can come. I was there, I took the notes. Okay, if you don't want to believe the Book of Mormon, but do not tell me that the Book of Mormon is not an ancient book. Do not insult my intelligence. Close quote. I wanted to stand up and shout hallelujah. Two quotes and then we'll be done. Neil Maxwell, talking about Moroni's promise. Remember, the key to Moroni's promise is real intent. You study this with real intent, and I'll make, the, I'll make the truth of it known to you by the power of the Holy Ghost. By the power of the Holy Ghost, you should know the truth of all things. Don't skip the words real intent. Dallin Oaks. God does not answer hypothetical questions. Coming from a lawyer like Dallin Oaks, that's perfect, because courts don't answer hypothetical questions. It has to be a case in controversy. It can't just be hypothetical. 
got to be real. That's why you have to have the real case with real plaintiffs and real defendants. If you're curious about the Book of Mormon, God will not answer your question because curiosity is not enough. I'm curious, but don't ask me to change my life. If I tell you it's true, what are you going to do? Well, I'm curious. By answering your question, God would then condemn you. You have knowledge you're not prepared to use. And he will not answer questions with people who are not ready for the answer. Right? Real intent means, tell me it's true and I'll change my life. I will give away all my kingdom to know thee. Hmm? Book of Mormon. Tell me it's true and I'll change my life. You have got to be prepared to do your part if you want the promise to have effect in your life. The other way to read the Book of Mormon, Neil Maxwell, the reverse approach, he says, scanning while doubting. Great Maxwellian. Scanning while doubting is different than searching with real intent. You'll never know. Is the flip side of Moroni's methodology and produces flippant conclusions Moroni's process of verification is surely not followed by many readers or reviewers of this book. They don't want to know that it's true. Now let me end with October Conference 2009. One of the great talks on this. I was jumping up and down when I, when I watched him give this talk. I was applauding. I, mean, I can only do that in my living room. I can't do it in conference. But I did it in my living room. I gave him a standing ovation. Okay. Safety for the Soul, Jeffrey R. Holland, October 2009. I testify that one cannot come to full faith in this latter-day work and thereby find the fullest measure of peace and comfort in these our times until he or she embraces the divinity of the Book of Mormon and the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom it testifies. If anyone is foolish enough or misled enough to reject 531 pages of heretofore unknown text teeming with literary and Semitic complexity without honestly attempting to account for the origin of those pages, especially without accounting for the powerful witness of Jesus Christ and the profound spiritual impact that witness has had on what is now tens of millions of readers. If that is the case, then such a person, elect or otherwise, has been deceived and if he or she leaves this church, it must be done by crawling over or under or around the Book of Mormon to make that exit. In that sense, the book is what Christ himself was said to be, quote, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, close quote, a barrier in the path of one who wishes not to believe in this work. If you tell me that Joseph Smith did not if you tell me that Joseph Smith did not get this book from God, then tell me where he got it. Do not insult my intelligence or those who have studied this book for a lifetime by telling us that this is a product of 19th century America. There is absolutely no evidence that Joseph Smith had any books with him when he was translating the Book of Mormon. There were 65 working days of translation, 65. Everybody who was there, including Oliver Cowdery, who later is disaffected, would have mentioned it. He became a prosecutor in Michigan. He was challenged multiple times for his witness to the Book of Mormon, which he never denied, just like Martin Harris and David Whitmer. Those are perfect witnesses for the other side. They're disaffected, but they never denied their testimony. And no evidence from any of them that Joseph ever cracked a book that he ever had a reference book on the Arabian Peninsula, for example, or Jewish law, or any of this. There is zero evidence. It's all made out of whole cloth because you can't explain this. The only way to explain this is, it is of God. And that is my testimony to you. I got it the good old-fashioned way. Through Moroni's promise, I know this is true. But then I have been building it, block by block, satisfying my mind. I reason, I understand that Revelation trumps reason. It does. But it's also nice
Austin Farrar, said this, Though argument does not create conviction, lack of it destroys belief. What seems to be proved may not be embraced, but what no one shows the ability to defend is quickly abandoned. Rational argument does not create belief, okay? but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish. Unibly said that the evidence that will prove or disprove the Book of Mormon does not exist. And I agree with him. Because God will not compromise your faith. We get to choose. We get to look at the evidence, weigh it, consider for ourselves, and make a decision. It's ultimately our choice. Because faith will always operate, and he will never take away faith and never take away our agency by making it obvious. This way to Zarahemla. We haven't found such a sign. We won't. Zarahemla probably is under water right now. Best choice of Zarahemla, by the way, is under a dam. So we're not going to see the sign that said Nephi was here. The evidence will not compel you in one direction or the other. That's where you get to choose. Do you exercise your faith in saying, yes, this is of God, or do you exercise your skepticism and say, no, the great, one of the greatest philosophers ever, German philosopher Goethe, said this. The deepest, the only theme of human history, compared to which all others are of subordinate importance, is the conflict of skepticism with faith. Which will you be? It's an individual question. I choose to believe. And I can back up my belief with evidence if it's necessary. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.